Hey folks, Dr. Garrett here along with Dr. H. It's been a while. Welcome back, guys. Yeah, it has been a week or two now, huh? <laughs> a few weeks, I think, or at least two. So apologies for the delay, everybody. But uh, You know how badly you were missing us. Yeah, everybody was waiting with bated breath for our yep. next episode. So <laughs> here we are. You can now all remain in a joyous day because we are back <laughs> here recording. Um, we're, so, happy, hey. we're happy to be back at the very least, right? For sure, for sure. And um, I mean, we've even missed out on some of our calls in the last two weeks too. So it's like us getting to hang out as well. Yep. Um, but today we are on the exercise version of our track of discussing a book, discussing an exercise, and uh, going into kind of more um, a, a research approach. And then of course our final week is this kind of uh, lifestyle or, or questions from students. And this week we are on our exercise variation. So we're going to be discussing the highly controversial squat. And what's funny is we, we actually avoided this because I think that's most people's default. And, and even in some of the classes that we've created, the squat is, has been this default exercise. It's very simple in nature and very foundational and fundamental, but there's so much complexity and we can make it a lot more confusing and whatever than it really needs to be. And so we avoided this because it's something that we've talked about a lot and included in our classes. And so we wanted to give you guys some different looks at different exercises, but it has come time officially to discuss the squat. And there's, you can get into the weeds with this thing. So we're going to be there. <laughs> we can't avoid it any, any longer. I think it's interesting that you say it's simple. I, I think that one of the reasons we've avoided it is because of the complexity is because there are so many uh, different, there's so many variations, there's so many different technique aspects that are important. Uh, but at, at, I mean, at the very root level, it can be a simplistic, like a fundamental movement that, mm -hmm. I mean, kids, kids do this, babies do this, um, right. and, you know, as they're sitting down, we see this all the time in, in less developed countries where they're not sitting in chairs all the time. They pop a squat down on the ground. And, mm -hmm. um, so it, it is a very fundamental type basic movement. Um, I think it can get complex when we start discussing external load and, and all that, but hey, we'll get into it. So Yeah. So the format, uh, just uh, to recall, we're going to give you guys the purpose for us. It's our opinion of that. And uh, or in our experience, we're giving you the purpose of why we would use this movement and its application for general population, athletes, tactical athletes, and so on. Um, we also talk about different variations as well as loading and some of the common faults that we see with this exercise as well. So. Uh, give me some give me some insight as to the purpose of this for you. So, as, as I mentioned in our, our quick and dirty version of this video, the the main purpose for me is that it allows us to throw external load and a significant amount of external load in a pretty easy way in, on those hip and knee extensor muscles. Mm -hmm. uh, so, obviously, as we drop down eccentrically, it's hip and knee flexion. I want to swat that fly out of here. <laughs> you can see it just landing on my ear and I'm trying not to flinch. I'm like, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Um, <laughs> just start at it through the screen. Um, but yeah, so hip, hip and knee flexion on the eccentric and hip and knee extension on the concentric. But it's, as many students often struggle with when we're first learning this, the same muscles are worked eccentrically and concentrically and they are the extensor muscles. So the quadriceps at the knee, and the hip extensors, meaning the glutes, hamstrings um, at, at the hip. Uh, so it's a way for us to throw some heavy load on those muscles. And why would we want to do that? Well, they're certainly significantly involved in running and jumping and, and pushing or driving. Um, a lot of sport type movements, a lot of life type movements are involved in, in the hip and the knee. So it's a great way for us to be able to throw a heavy load on those big muscles and, and load them effectively, I, I would say. And loading the spine too, if we're talking about loading kind of like, go, go. I could see your brain working. <laughs> I, I think, so I, I don't know, I maybe want to save that part of it. I want to ask some questions later about longevity and, and the squat. Yeah. Um, there's certainly, there's absolutely a, a notable or significant component of, of loading the trunk. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that as, I think there's discussion on that as a strength and a weakness. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about longevity. So when we talk about sport performance and application there, certainly that's a, a positive benefit that we're, we're recruiting a lot of muscles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not just at the hip and the knee, uh, we're recruiting through the trunk and certainly in, in many sports, any sport where there's contact involved, 
the ability to transmit force from the lower body into the upper body and, and not have any, any kind of uh, kinks in the chain or weak points along that, mm -hmm. uh, that force transmission chain is really important. So that there's absolutely some value there in, in coordinating that and learning to transmit force all the way through the body, through the trunk especially. Mm -hmm. So there's there's absolutely value there from my standpoint. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, jumping off of that too, because I because I like the squat. It's one of those exercises that you can load more than any others within the framework of what we're talking about. Some people might be able to deadlift more than they can squat, but now we're talking about a posterior dominant, still a hip extension. Uh, uh, the deadlift being still a hip extension driven movement, um, but this is the best way to load up the spine and to push the most amount of weight possible and an argument can be made well what about the leg press but the spine isn't loaded there and so this is um and, and it's also the the back squat specifically is one of those things that it it kind of mimics the real world as far as well pam I, I keep like making these statements and i'm like oh i'm gonna get caught in the weeds here i'm gonna say this and then have to backtrack so um, <laughs> Because, well, but here's the thing is, is the back squat really the most natural version of the squat? I don't know. I don't hold anything on my back and just start repping yeah. things out. But I do pick up my kids in, in front of me like this, or I pick up, you know, objects or whatever. So if anything, a goblet squat or a front squat is probably more representative of a, uh, a real world squat, if you will. But the back squat well, allows... Go, to go into your example of like a uh, leg press, though. It's, I would say the big difference is open versus closed chain. If yeah. you talk about yeah. like developing... Uh, or throwing on external load with a, with a leg press, it's an open chain movement, which is not how we typically perform those movements in the real world, where it's closed chain pushing against the ground yeah. uh, and, and developing force that way. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I would say the back squat is the best way to overload this particular movement of ankle, knee, and hip flexion remaining a neutral spine with load like an axial load, uh, mm -hmm. whereas a deadlift isn't that in that manner. Um, yeah. It's skill transfer, like we're, you know, flexing at the ankle, knee, and hip, and there's a lot of stuff that requires to do that. As we mentioned, it's foundational, fundamental type movement pattern for people. Um, and then finally, the, the psychological component, which I didn't get to get too deep into with uh, the, the short version of this, but I mean, it is, anyone that's squatted heavy knows that it is miserable at the bottom. And if you're someone that has a poor range of motion like myself, it's even, it's like, uh, three times more uncomfortable because it's already awkward to get down into that position. I'm six foot four. I'm all legs. Like my hips are at my wife's shoulders, man. I like, I'm just all legs. And so this is not a fun movement for me and probably most basketball players. Um, anyways, uh, but being at the bottom of a squat is very uncomfortable. It feels like, and this is uh, oftentimes I use it as a metaphor for life where it just feels like the world is coming down on you and it's crushing you. And you have the decision to either keep pushing until you stand up or you let it crumble you. And, um, and so I just, I, I oftentimes think about that. That was one of the first things in the gym that I remember kind of being able to translate to a, a particular time in my life where just, it felt like everything was, you know, crushing me down and I had to make a choice. Am I going to keep pushing or am I just going to kind of give up? Whereas other movements, you can simply let go. If you're deadlifting, you just, if, if it's too heavy, just let go of the bar. Um, but when you're in the bottom of the squat, you don't have many options. Um, and bailing out of a squat is ugly. Um, and so uh, equally <clears throat> ugly is like a bench press. And that's kind of the same. That's like the upper body version of that to me, which is, you know, once that bar comes down to your chest and you can't get it off, that's a bad feeling. So you can either push or maybe you need to get creative in how you're going to get that weight off of you in order to fight and live another day. Because I've been in both those predicaments and they are not fun. So it's just a, a cycle. It's interesting how you you bring up the the psychological aspect of man this is a difficult thing and it maybe either takes a somebody who's got some issues to get in and get in under that and enjoy that or I mean basically yeah, but the point I'm making is if you go to a box gym and your your typical you know gym in the neighborhood or whatever you don't see very many people squatting. Mm -hmm. I think we can apply that to a lot of different aspects of life. It's like if you guys want to, if you want to get better at dealing with something uncomfortable, this is a great way to do mm -hmm. that. And there's a reason you don't see a lot of people doing it. There's a reason you don't see a lot of people doing hard things in life to get better at them. Like mm -hmm. there's a very, there's a parallel there with, with a lot of uh, life lessons. So. Well, and that's like the faith integration piece for me where it comes in both nutrition as well as exercise. And this is, I've shared this before. My testimony is like, this is how God grabbed me really is 
Like these, the, the lessons and, and some of the teachings of this hardship and discomfort in the Bible, it produces perseverance. Um, yeah. the, the discipline of eating healthy regularly is like it talks about in Hebrews where it's like no discipline is enjoyable at the time, but man, doing these things is like really how it works. Like there's no scooting around it. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta be uncomfortable sometimes, not sometimes you need to be uncomfortable in order to progress to another level. And, um, when we got, get into loading, there's different versions of that, you know, and sometimes in life, the, it's going to be a one rep max day and it's going to be very heavy and very uncomfortable. And other times in our journey or this kind of process of life, it's lighter and more manageable, but ultimately there's, there's always got to be some stress in order to progress. Hmm. So, so I don't want to get us necessarily too far off track. Do you think everybody should squat? Um, I think, I think there's application to some variation for everyone. Um, I, I mean, I, I think about this with kids, it's, you don't need to tell them to squat. They're going to do that. Like they're up and down all the time, but I had a grand, I had my grandma 93 years old when I was training her and like, she didn't do squats, but I was helping her get up and down out of a chair. I mean, I vividly remember like grabbing both of her frail thin bony hands and i would like help her stand up and help her sit down now the odd part is this was out of a um like one of those chairs that helped boost you up i set mm -hmm. it like not at its lowest position but not at its highest i put it in different positions and helped her stand up and sit down stand up and sit down so some variation of a squat which is ankle knee and hip flexion to ankle knee and hip extension yes I, from that perspective yes everyone needs a squat but yeah. does everyone need to like load up a heavy barbell and back squat and overhead squat and front squat and zercher squat? No, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think <clears throat> kind of where I was, where I was at least mentally going with that is kind of, we've talked about this before about like, you don't necessarily need to go out and look for suffering in your life because mm -hmm. suffering comes. But I think like the benefit of, of dealing with a heavy squat is, you know, the psychological benefit of knowing that you can, overcome something difficult and it's kind of uh, the parallel with life there would be we don't need to necessarily go out and look for more suffering but but having experienced it at some point and i kind of my thinking is everybody should train the squat at some point in their life mm -hmm. i don't necessarily think you need to always train a heavy squat or or do that forever uh, and we can get into the longevity discussion later but um, at least having spent some time doing that and learning how to overcome something mm -hmm. difficult i think that's where there's a lot of psychological value for sure. parallels to life, I would say. And I mean, like, that's the beauty of, of the lessons of the Bible for me is that if you don't like exercising, then I mean, there's a lesson in that where it's doing something that you might not want to do, knowing that there's ultimately a benefit for that. But these same hardships are in everything. It's not just weightlifting. It's just a very, a very real manifestation of that where it's like, you know, you could be talking about a musician and it's hard to, you know, walk the fingers on the, the fretboard. And that's difficult. And so that can be that same, oh, I had to overcome this. I had to have technique and all that. And I get that. But it's not as physically, you don't feel it the same way. Uh, the message is still the same. Yeah. yeah, something challenging, something difficult. But the, the, man, if you haven't been under a heavy squat, be trained up. And, you know, don't just throw on a heavy barbell and put on as much weight as you can. But you're going through a, you know, Bulgarian squat cycle or what was what was that popular one years ago? Smolov, like, Smolov, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I, I done all the stupid stuff and you know, but you, I mean, I think that's what we're saying though, is there's, there's value for, for anybody who's listening, who's interested in movement and the body and kinesiology. I think there's value in at least going through a learning phase of mm -hmm. how to deal with a squat properly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, let me, um, am I doing, I should have been doing this view the whole time, I think. Um, anyways, oops. So I, I changed the view from um, grid to, or oh. that, whatever, whatever, uh, to speaker view. Um, so uh, in, in terms of longevity though, like we're talking about the, the, necess the necessity to go through this thing and be challenged and for it to be difficult. So do you wanna get into longevity now or is sure. that more yeah. related okay. to loading? Uh, there, there's there's application in both um it's up to you we can do either one let's wait let's wait let's go into okay. so i mean the purpose again is to let's load the system um particularly something that requires ankle knee and hip flexion particularly from like this 
vertical top down stress rather than um, more of a horizontal stress to standing up something like a deadlift or whatever, because they're both training hip extensors. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's talk about variation. This is, I mean, you could probably spend an hour just on this. I mean, what we talked about in the short one, the big three are going to be your front, back, and overhead. Um, and even within those, there's a ton of variations. Yeah. So, do, you have that, do you have that picture? Can you share that picture yeah. of uh, our variations? This one here. There we go. Yeah. So uh, we got a goblet squat in the beginning, a front squat uh, following that here in this image, back squat, high bar back squat, low bar back squat. Um, so maybe let's talk about each of these and where they would apply. We talked about that they have that each are valuable because they have a particular application. So what are the particular applications of these for for you? Uh, so let's I mean let's start on the left I guess with the goblet squat. I I personally think this is a really I I like using the goblet squat when I'm teaching someone how to squat. Mm -hmm. um, typically I'm going to start with body weight first, um, and we'll get into. Maybe we'll get into this with, with loading as well. <laughs> I don't want to save all of my, my stuff for the loading, but um, when I teach a squat, I, I almost always, depending on the, 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 the person that I'm working with, if they're super coordinated, athletic, and you know, no limitations, flexibility or mobility wise, typically they can do a free squat, no problem. But for most people or most of the general population that I've worked with, a box squat is much easier to teach uh, as a beginning, beginning component. Um, and, and loading that with a goblet, I think, or with kind of holding the, the dumbbell mm -hmm. up in front uh, is a really easy way to do that. I think you brought up an interesting point about um, if we were to look to the natural world in terms of where does the squat manifest itself, very rarely do we put something heavy on our back and, and lift it up just because it's not, getting into that position is not, there's not a lot of natural outlets for that mm -hmm. um, other than a squat rack. Um, the thing, that, the thing that I would think about would be kind of like a yoke. Um, if you're carrying like two heavy um, buckets of water, you know, I've, I've seen people doing that in less developed countries. Mm -hmm. um, but even, even with that, you're typically not doing a, a full squat. And if you do, it's only once at the beginning to lift it up and then you walk for a certain distance and then put it down. So real quick. Yeah. Yeah. So something to add to that though, and why the specifically the back squat in terms of loading is the best is because we can load the back squat heavier than any other variation. There's yeah. not, there's a reason why there's not a front rack or a front squat in a powerlifting meet It's because you don't squat front squat as much as you back squat. So although it doesn't have as much application in terms of like positioning to get under the weight and lift the weight, it does allow us to lift the most amount of weight, which then translates to because we're using all those same muscles to hit other variations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think that's an important point, but uh, going back to the goblet squat. So again, I like using this. It's a simple way to teach the squat. I think it also does a good job of, for people who are unaccustomed or new to, to resistance exercise and, and lifting, uh, this is typically a pretty easy way to um, introduce some external load without mm -hmm without really throwing off body mechanics too much, it's, it's, I find it's a pretty easy pattern for most people to adopt. Um, as soon as you get into the barbell, I don't know if it's a mental thing or what, but a lot of people kind of technique goes a little bit out the window. <laughs> yeah, why do, you, why do you think that is? I, I think for me, I'll answer my own question first, is like, I, I, I honestly feel like a lot of times it's the shoulder and what the shoulder can do because the people are just trying to find that comfortable spot with the barbell, whereas the goblet squat, there's a little bit more freedom. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas the back squat, you, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of shoulder mobility just to get a, the barbell in a comfortable position on your back, regardless of whether it's high, low, whatever. Um, whereas the goblet squat, you can mess with posture a little bit more. I think tangibly people feel themselves falling forward more and then you can control that by lifting the weight up a little bit versus a back squat if you got bad mobility lifting the back, like it, it's just different. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't, I was, yeah, I think it's, it's just different is a good way to say it. Um, I think, I think because of the fact that there's more trunk freedom with this, I think people are just at more ease with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very unnatural and very rarely practiced thing to have something heavy on your back mm -hmm. uh, and be expected to move the extremities while the trunk is, is really, 
kind of locked down. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with the goblet squat, because there's a little bit more freedom there, I think people kind of psychologically or mentally have, they're, they're, they're less worried about it or scared of it maybe um, mm -hmm. in the very beginning. Anyway, um, I think the goblet squat is, it's a, I mean, how would you, how would you characterize this in terms of where does it fall between back squat and front squat? What do you, uh, what do you mean? Like as far as similarities or loading or? Yeah, like, I mean, if we look at, like, the first three images here, it's definitely closer to a front squat in terms of mechanics to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's – maybe I, I need to think of a different question there, perhaps. But what, what other elements of the goblet squat do you, uh, do you use or do you use it all when, you, when you're coaching or working with people? Yeah, I think, quite honestly, the only real limitation of a goblet squat is the loading factor, is mm -hmm. you're just never going to be able to load it up. But as far as challenging, as far as it's one of those, it, to me, it's almost like one of those things that simultaneously corrects posture and position while challenging it. Yeah. Um, whereas there's less, there's going to be more opportunity for fixing posture because it's not like getting your elbows here into a front squat, getting a barbell up into someone's throat. Like these are all limiting factors for people getting comfortable with the front squat, which is very valuable. Back yeah. squat, same thing as this mobility issue, whereas the goblet squat, it allows you to be where you need to be. Um, so for me, you, you squat, say it's almost like a, a safety bar front squat kind of? Yeah, yeah, more or less. Or Well, it's, the, it's a front loaded version of a safety bar squat. Kind of how it feels to me, I guess. It's yeah, like, yeah. This is an easy position to get into. Like mm -hmm. a, a safety bar, for those who don't know, is basically like a, a thick foam pad that kind of lets the bar sit on your back so you can squat with your hands here rather than trying to get into this yeah. position here. Yeah. And, and so like, I like the, I like the goblet squat primarily as a warm up um, for my athletes, for myself. Um, I do working with kettlebells though. I do a lot more goblet squatting or front rack squatting where I'm holding it in the front, but it's not my front racks. My front squat with a kettlebell is not up here. It's still, like yeah. in this kind of home position. So it's more of a goblet squat anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the goblet squat. It's just, it's never, we're never going to train it heavy enough to really right. transfer to any true strength. We're not going to get real strength from it. And that's its primary limitation for me. But as far as a teaching movement, a preparatory movement, a, yeah. you know, a, a challenging posture movement, I think it's great. It's me just, yeah. you can't overload it. Yeah, I, I see it as a great introductory piece. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, what do you, how about this? Do you think, would, do you think it'd be easier to, or what, what movement do you think would be better as far as teaching? Would it be a goblet squat? Or do you think something like a zercher squat would be better? Or is it so similar that it doesn't really matter? And assuming the zercher's with the sandbag or something manageable. Basically, like, is there a particular position? Because these two are different. The front squat and the goblet squat, similar but different. Is there a particular front loaded variation or apparatus external resistance that you like to use i honestly i've never i've never asked anyone else to do a zercher squat i've done them but <laughs> i've never like when i've trained like general population it's not something i would have 99 percent. in the tactical community you got like For that sure. is very real so that's yeah, why absolutely. i bring that up absolutely. as a variation like Man, that's that they squat like that more than they would ever squat with something on their yeah. back or like this. So yeah. a zercher squat is almost the most realistic of all these because you're kind of in this cradled hugging position while yeah. you're squatting and like scooping something up and picking it up. So you know. I think so. I, I mean, I think I wish we had a picture of that because it's it's something most people probably haven't heard of. I would guess, but maybe uh, maybe see if we can pull one of those up. But it's. It is so uncomfortable to do a heavy zercher squat. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, with a with a sandbag, less so. Like I, I think sandbag zerchers are are certainly for the tactical population very applicable. Um, doing it with a barbell is just just uncomfortable for yeah. the arms. Um, and, and again, I think I think you run into the issue of loading with that. Is like how heavy can you? You end up the minimum or the uh, lowest common denominator ends up being the arms. Is how much you can hold in your arms rather than how much your hips and knees can drive up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I see that as as one of the weaknesses there. But to the point you're making, like for the tactical population, makes a lot of sense. I I don't know about you, but for me, when I've done zerchers, man, what a 
challenge to the trunk that is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that's a it's difficult to maintain proper posture, and there's certainly value in in creating some some additional stress to to the trunk stabilizers uh, for something like that. Yeah, let me. I'm trying to find a. Well, uh, there's plenty of pictures here. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm trying to. The keep sending me to YouTube here. Um, mm-hmm. Here's one. Let's see. Um, but basically, it's like this front loaded uh, position. Let's see here. Um, let me see if I could share this. Are you so, to at least so while you're pulling that up? I mean, verbally, it's just you're you're kind of cradling whether it's a sandbag or a barbell in your arms and then yeah. squatting it. So. so you're just holding it, and once that small, thin, firm barbell gets in the crook of your elbow, it ain't comfy. That's for sure. No, for sure. <laughs> Much more, and so basically, but it does it does challenge the posture. But I'm finding like so for someone like me with a limited range of motion, that is uh like i like this front loaded stuff for me it helps a lot more with my range of motion and depth and everything i find that i can more comfortably and easily get into a nice deep squat with a front rack versus a back rack so if we i mean if we go back to that our our picture of the the four different squats i think one of the interesting things you'll see in the both the goblet squat and the front squat is a much more vertical torso Mm -hmm. Um, certainly you, you have that with the high bar uh, back squat as well, the kind of the Olympic style squat. Um, but the, if you, if we look at the low bar back squat on the far right there, or kind of the powerlifting type squat, mm-hmm. um, that, that feeling of kind of a more horizontal torso, that's another thing that's very, um, foreign to, to most people too. It's like, that's, that's not a very intuitive position to get into where you're, you're more horizontal and, mm-hmm. and using a lot of hip drive, even though I think there's certainly a lot of, uh, potential. I mean, we can, we can load that one up the heaviest, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's not as intuitive. I don't think for most people. Yeah. And, but, and this is maybe I was not listening well enough, but one thing to also mention is when we talk about a neutral spine, all of these are neutral spines, even though there's three different spine angles. Mm-hmm. So it's important to note that, that a neutral spine doesn't mean straight up and down. And we've talked about this before. A neutral spine just means straight so or neutral this would be flexion this being extension and this is still a neutral spine here and now i it's your the ability to keep that neutral spine maybe significantly more challenged the more horizontal you get with your spine but if you can keep the line of action of the barbell over the midfoot you're going to have a greater chance of success at that um Mm -hmm. So it, real quick, one thing with variations, how would you, do you, would you pick a certain variation based on your athlete? So say we're working with a basketball player, super tall and lanky, their back squat looks like hot garbage just because they can't get into that position, but they look safe and effective in their front squat. Even though we can't load the front squat as heavy, would it be more advantageous to have that basketball player working in a front squat position, even though we're not able to, because we're going to be able to get them stronger, but sure. will it be yeah. a driven adaptation that we're looking for? If we're looking to build strength in our athletes, would you rather do a back squat that doesn't look as good, doesn't have as good, of, or maybe looks okay, but not as good of a range of motion? So basically I'm asking, would you take range of motion over load? I think the key would be is, uh, is kind of technique as far as, is it, is it correct in terms of, is this going to cause injury or, um, or is, or is the athlete able to do it safely? I think that's where, to me, that's, that's where the decision hinge, hinges on is, are we creating potential injury or is this, uh, just, just a aesthetic type of thing? So it's safe. I'll, I'll, I'll add layers here. It's safe, but the range of motion is not as good. So again, you're, you're taking some, both of them are safe, we'll say, but in order to maintain a safe back squat position, the range of motion is substantially decreased, but the load is, I would then, I'll, for sake of argument, is substantially increased. Whereas mm-hmm. the front squat, the range of motion is substantially increased and the weight is substantially decreased. Now mm-hmm. what substantial is, we can drill down there too. Um, like for example, if it's one inch deeper on the front squat, but we're sacrificing 100 pounds of load, well, that's, mm-hmm. that's an easy answer. But basically yeah. I'm saying like, are you willing to lose a little bit of range of motion for more strength or would you want the range of motion for a little bit less weight? Mm. 
I think it's, a, I would, I mean, to really dig into that, I would want to look more at, at some research on what, what is, what are the athletic outcomes of some of these different things? Um, what is, what is the research support? I would, I would want to do that before making a final decision. Mm-hmm. Um, I think speaking very generally, I'm not concerned so much if, the athlete, let's say, can't hit depth of a, let's say, a perfectly parallel squat, as we would see, like, on any of these examples here. Mm-hmm. Um, safety is the number one priority, and then athletic transfer. If Again, the goal for an athlete is performance on the court or the field, mm-hmm. not necessarily what their squat looks like. I don't – I'm not cons- – at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If we're getting the athletic benefit from it, that's the point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so – Assuming they're moving safe. Yeah, assuming, assuming, yeah, rule number one, right? Do no harm. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that? I, like I said, I would want to be, I would want to do some more reading on that. Yeah, I would, I mean, yes, that, of course, uh, more research and diving into that, but pragmatically, I guess, or like thinking about it um, in this moment, I wonder because, I mean, you want your athletes to be as strong as possible, but if we're talking about like, I would say that a front rack is probably more transferable in some respects to basketball than a back squat. Like um, the load being in front and the majority of the manipulation is going to be in front. And like just that movement of rebounding and fighting people off in front of you to jump, like a front squat almost seems more uh, representative of the sport, perhaps as far as at least proximity of the resistance. Um, but again, I mean, the I, as, I, as I think about this, I'm, I feel like if just thinking about the jumping, like if you look at a jump, most of the time, I think there's more hip flexion than knee flexion. Mm-hmm. Um, in which case I would say a back squat would have more applicability. Sure. sure. And we're loading the back side more too. Like it's more, yeah. like it's more posterior dominant. Um, but even, okay. So even going down that road, there's also a difference that if like, if you squat slow and you're strong, that doesn't mean you're going to jump way higher. You need to squat with speed. And that's like almost a whole nother discussion is the, the force in which we're producing for these things too. Well, I think, I mean, that, that brings up the interesting point of, I mean, you look at like conjugate style or West side style training where you're incorporating a heavy day and a speed day or dynamic day in the same week Mm -hmm. where we want to hit both of those where we want to be strong to express maximal force, but we want to be fast with that force too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say both need to be incorporated sure. for, for yeah. athletic, athletic or, or force development type, type stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. So variations we talked about, uh, did we talk about foot position and like what? stance width and everything, or are we still on this here? Let's, let's cover high bar and low bar real quick. Just, okay. just so we get into that. Just, just to touch on it. Go for it. So the biggest, I mean, for me, the biggest thing aside from the bar position, obviously, is like this shin angle here. How right. much more vertical this shin is here than the high bar back squat. So what, what, and, what mechanically, what difference does that make at the knee and the hip? Uh, what do you mean? How do, I mean, how does, how does having, let's say, the high bar back squat here, so image number three, left to right, and then yeah. low bar back squat, image number four, what, what does that change for? Just explain that to the viewer from your perspective. How does that change the you know, which muscles are, are perhaps more yeah. dominant in that. In yeah, that I think for me, this high bar squat is going to be a little bit more quad dominant or knee dominant, whereas this low bar is loaded more into the posterior. And you can see this very clearly. I mean, the, again, the shins are more vertical and the more vertical your shins are, the more posterior dominant that particular exercise is going to be. Um, I, I don't have a stance on which one is better than the other, but that that's going to be the primary mechanical difference is more Mm -hmm. posterior dominant versus anterior dominant so for me if we want to train the anterior i would say let's load up because we get another variation let's goblet squat front squat something that's kind of anterior the the resistance is anterior and that's going to force my knees to come forward in order to maintain a more neutral spine or a more a vertical or erect spine Um, by default loading from the front is going to typically do that and you see this here right like This is a back squat, but the bar is so high that now it's more forward than something like a low bar, which is now more posterior back. Um, So I think it'd be interesting to point out, and I think you've kind of touched on this, but to reiterate the fact that in each of these images, well, at least least with the bar involved, 
the bar, if you were to draw a plumb line straight down from the bar, it's right over the midfoot in each instant. Mm -hmm. And so kind of, at least the way I view this is the reason why the spine changes in terms of its anterior inclination is if you get the bar out over the toes, it's going to pitch you too far forward. So like if you were to put the high bar back squat um, in the same spinal position as the low bar, the bar would be way out over the toes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's you, you're not going to be able to squat effectively from there. Uh, so there's there's all these things that influence like e each one of these. Every time you manipulate one factor, it's going to manipulate the other. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, you know the knee position or the shin position um, is a result of where the bar is. It's it's you know one thing is impacting the others. But if you notice the the proper technique here is that the weight is right over the midfoot in each instance. Mm -hmm. And is that achieved by the spinal position or, I mean, I guess it, like you said, it's, it's all of them. I'm just thinking about like, if this, if, if any of these had a flexed spine, the bar would be in front of the midfoot on all of them. So is it the back staying neutral or just kind of how our hips are orienting around those things and our hips and knees? Yeah, I think, I think it's a, a combination of all of those. Like, as soon as you change one variable, the other two are going to change, yeah. whether it's spine, hip, or knee. So, mm -hmm. I think it's important just to point out, though, for for students who are learning about some of the mechanics involved, the biomechanics, I suppose you should say, is there's there's a, a downstream effect of all of this. You change one variable, and just know that it's going to influence some of this other stuff too. Um, and so, when you look at something like, hey, if do I want to develop more of the quadricep? Well, then I want more of a, a position like we would see kind of in the middle of the screen here where um, where we have more knee flexion occurring uh, mm -hmm. and we get you know more of that influence on the quadriceps versus um, you know going all the way to the far right if we want to develop more of the glutes and the the, the low back and the trunk and hamstrings um, I wonder so maybe maybe if you could pull up that picture of uh, Chuck um, talking about uh, glute and hamstring development I mean we're taking it to the extreme of uh, the uh, the box squat is typically practiced a lot with powerlifters, and they're they're really trying to develop. Do you have that the picture yeah. of? Uh, I was just showing this one other one here, which is another good example. the The plumb line is brutal because I think it's not accurate, but um, as far as the uh, like just shin position and like how much flexion at the ankle, the dorsiflexion at the ankle there is, it's significantly different. But again, yeah. both have an initial <laughs> spine. Yep. And both are generally over the midfoot. So let me. You hear about like, so the example of like West Side Barbell, you hear Louis Simmons talk about um, like they would often try to box squat with a, a shin position that was either vertical or like posterior. So yeah. like it, like they were doing like a hamstring curl basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so you talk about like these guys you looking to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So this is a, a power lifter by the name of Chuck Vogelpohl. Um, who is pretty legendary in the West Side Barbell scene. Um, but you look at the difference in shin angle and how close that shin is to vertical. Um, certainly, you know, there's implications here with wearing a squat suit and how that changes the mechanics as well. All of these things were going to play a role. Um, but the whole point being, um, again, going back to the idea of what is the goal? If the goal is to develop the posterior chain, the glutes, the hamstrings, et cetera, and the, the trunk, uh, a more vertical shin angle is going to help you do that or challenge you to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we got variations, uh, foot position or toe position rather. Yep. Um, I would say anatomically, if we're going to speak from anatomical position, the more, the more closely we can um, replicate anatomical position, an argument can be made that the, the better, or more efficient amount of musculature would be recruited for that particular exercise. As soon as we start shifting the toes out, 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 or in, 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 which no one ever teaches, um, there's probably a good reason for that. Um, but I guess that that is interesting is like, why, why is it okay to have excessive amounts of external rotation, but not like uh, any internal rotation? And I, that's kind of a dumb question, but it's interesting that one way is, without problem and the other way is like devastatingly detrimental so um, I mean, there's there's obviously an effect on the knee and the, the kind of the, the knee and hip angle like where the femur is tracking mm -hmm. based on what the toes are doing so if you have your toes in like try and do a squat with the toes in like the hip internally rotated so your foot your feet are pointing inwards yeah 
yeah. try and do that and keep the knee like the femur is going to track yeah. inwards as well so it's automatically going to collapse yeah inward. whereas if i think there's there's a little bit there's i think anatomically a little bit more room for error there if we have externally rotated mm -hmm. hip and the feet are pointed out sure. we can get and we can push the knees out and still kind of be correct mm -hmm. uh, in that sense um without getting into you know catastrophic technique um a little bit there so there's more room for error i would say external rotation than internal yeah so foot position, how do you generally like default that? Is it straight ahead, five degrees out, 10 degrees out? What does that mean? What is five degrees out when people are like, yeah, 13.2 degrees is optimal toe position. It's like, so you got a tape measure and you got like a, you got, you know, you got a little measuring device or what are we doing here? So as far as how do I, like, how do I teach it? I, I mean, it's it's there's a lot of anytime you deal with the squat you're dealing with individual differences in anatomy and and mobility and all that so i think there's considerations to be made there i i personally like a little bit of external rotation or feet a little bit out but i also i've heard good arguments for why toes should be forward or i mean there's even i, I know of a few uh kind of coaching groups or styles that follow toes in mm -hmm. uh, and they, they do a, a, a more of a, a heel elevated um, squat and, and not, not a lot of um, true like heavy back squats, but more of kind of... Um, oh, is that the adduction like, that they're going after? The, the landmine, like having kind of a you know, barbell in the corner, you're holding it in the front rack position um, with almost like a board, a board that's kind of like this. Mm -hmm. So the, the toes are slightly inwards um, and the heels are elevated. Um, almost like so you have a little bit of natural um, pronation going on a little bit mm -hmm. um, I, I I haven't explored that too much so I'm, I'm not gonna I don't want to go down that road necessarily just to say that it's out there I've seen it um, I think there's there's room for discussion on that um, me personally I, I I tend to squat best with toes just a little bit out um, I don't think it's a great idea to have them way out um, you'll hear people like Kelly Sturrett talks about the ability to create torque at the hip. Um, and the more, the more external rotation you have at setup, the less torque you can create. Like there's no more room to externally rotate there. Whereas if you have the toes pointed straight ahead, you can really torque hard to push external, uh, get some of that external rotation torque. Or one of the cues you'll hear from a lot of power lifters is kind of the spread the floor idea, which is more abduction than yeah. external rotation. Yes, and that's exactly like I hear so much of knees out or externally rotate, but in reality, the more like the more I was playing with that stuff, I found that it was more important as a cue, at least for me, was abduction, frontal right. plane, like spreading the earth this way, not this yeah. way. Like yeah. you're not like you're not ripping it apart, you're like pulling it apart or yeah, it's like, this way. Want, like it's more yeah. of a this movement here versus just this. It's it's really both, but that's the importance of working through understanding that our something like the hip can move through those planes of motion because there's external rotation there's abduction and then there's flexion and extension but the yeah. flexion and extension is occurring once those other kind of pieces have been established mm -hmm. yeah it's i think it's interesting like there's i have i'm kind of i have mixed thoughts about all of that because if you think about it just from a efficiency standpoint if the goal is hip extension why do you want to add lateral movement or or rotational movement. It's, it seems almost like you're taking away from the overall goal. But I also understand the importance of, like you talk about like tightness, or that's one of the things that's preached over and over from people who've lifted three times as much as I have. So what do I know? Right, right, right. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's got to be some value in paying attention to people who have walked the walk and done that. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they say spreading the floor is going to make a difference in terms of tightness, which it does, uh, when we're kind of loading up some of that abduction, like we look at the the action of the gluteus maximus, for example, is extension and there's abduction, external rotation. It does it does all of those things. So I understand why it would make sense from that perspective to maximize the action of the gluteus maximus muscle, mm -hmm. uh, which plays a big role in in the squat. So I, I see both sides of it. I think it does make sense to incorporate some of that extra tightness. I think. I've certainly noticed benefit from from that rather than just trying to do a straight sagittal plane movement right because and i think that's that's the importance and that's also maybe a difference of using and working with barbells rather than something like a smith machine or kind of a pre-fixed movement for us yep. whereas you do 
you do use a machine and and that could dictate more of the musculature that you would need and don't need whereas something like a free weight exercise you need some of that extra stability in order yeah. to perform that so yeah um yeah it's it I, I mean the other the other part of my brain says well in the real world you're not thinking about external rotation or spreading the floor if i'm if I'm trying to push you over, I'm only thinking about driving forward. I'm not thinking about driving externally. Yes. For sake of argument, though, no one's <laughs> thinking about that unless we as the coaches bring that up to them as well. So, like, they they squat or what? about the flexion and extension, that my muscle piece, like, it's just I'm picking this up, not, hey, I should pick it up like this. Because when I'm picking up a heavy rock, I'm going, like, I'm going through the steps. But that's because I know what they are. Mm -hmm. And or, like, I... I naturally think about that, whereas not everyone naturally thinks about that. that. That might be something that is unique to someone that's studying kinesiology is the kind of willingness to wonder, or go down that road of what does this look like, you know? Yeah, yeah. So one of the other, one of the other pieces I think would be important to touch on with the feet um, would be, I, I don't know how many people, but it seems a good number of people have at least some uh, mobility deficiency with ankle dorsiflexion mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the common errors <laughs> yeah. um, one of the common errors you'll see with the squat is um, if you actually watch people's feet if they have limitations in dorsiflexion the feet are going to collapse into per mm -hmm. into uh, what is that eversion, uh, eversion yeah mm -hmm. uh, and so like the the, the arch would, the arch collapse immediately which then affects the knee coming into into mm -hmm. a valgus collapse so all of those things, you know, there's, there's a domino effect of that as well. Um, and so kind of watching that and, and maybe if you're working with somebody who has a limitation with dorsiflexion and they can't, they can't effectively do that. Well, certainly that's something to work on. We need to address the root cause. Uh, but if you want them squatting, what are your thoughts on elevated heel for someone like that? Yeah. You know, what's funny is I was just thinking, I just wrote down, I wrote push heels, meaning everyone's cue is I'd have them push through the heels. And then you got guys like Cal Dietz who are specifically elevating the heel and performing these exercises with that. And his deal, and I don't know the full story on it, so I, I don't want to speak out of, out of line here, but basically it's the necessity for foot strength. And in mm -hmm. sport, the value of that, like, I mean, especially when you're wearing a cleat and there's like this kind of cast around your foot, essentially, having strong feet is important. Um, mm -hmm. And speaking of, before I go into the heel part, digging your toes into the ground is critical as well, whether you've got an elevated heel or not. But I think the biggest, it's, it's like a neutral spine misconception almost, where neutral spine, again, you don't, it doesn't have to be vertical. It can be out here. Um, I don't need you on your heels. I don't want you on your heels. There's no sport ever that's played on the heels. So I don't want that. And that cue can be misleading to people where it's driving through. And if your toes aren't buried into the ground, you're missing force production that could be pressed into the floor. So I think it's important to talk about a better distribution of weight through the foot, if not maybe a little bit more in the toe box rather than in the heels. I'd rather my athletes be a little bit more toe heavy than heel heavy as I've kind of started to and continue to think about foot position. I'd rather it be a little bit more there. Now, I don't want you doing a pirouette or whatever where you're on your tippy toes and you're squatting like that that's not effective but a little bit of heel elevation I'm almost arguing isn't as bad as maybe I would have thought in the past that's one of those retraining my brain where it's you push through the heels that's the cue I learned all throughout my life and now it's like but why are we neglecting having our toes dug into the ground too that's weird I think there's a, a huge takeaway there as far as always ask why because yeah like, there's, there's so many there's so many cues and things that you'll hear um, throughout sports and, and the gym world. And it, I think it's, I think there's a lot of importance in why, why wait, why am I doing it this way? Like, is, mm -hmm. does this make sense from everything I know about the body and things I observe uh, the body doing, you know, in elite athletes or in the natural world, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I think, especially for the athlete, it makes a lot of sense to, if anything, err on the side of the toe rather than the heel. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, if you try and, try and go run a sprint with your toes elevated and, and the heel and being like, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, no so shot. yeah, interesting. But anyways, yeah. So some takeaways and one thing too is like, don't be a contrarian just to be a contrarian and don't, <laughs> when you're, when you have a 20 plus year strength conditioning specialist and they say something, don't go like, 
no, that's not allowed. You say like, oh, can you tell me more about why you're doing this approach? So also understand that like, yes, question everything, but there's a, there's a respectable way to do that as well as like a, a productive way, I guess would be a better way of saying it. there's a productive way to challenge things. And taking everything at face value is not wise, but saying no to everything isn't wise either. So um, it's not, I would say it's like, instead of trying to prove something wrong, see if you can see if you can if see if there's something that you could learn from it, maybe. Yeah. But I mean, but isn't research, the idea of research is to prove your idea wrong. And then, and that ultimately gives you, comes to the conclusion that the hypothesis was right. Well, the research is always about 20 years behind the field too. So yeah. <laughs> there's, there's strengths and weaknesses to, to all of that. So for sure. um, I think to kind of sum things up though, for the foot, I would say, at least for me, like, I think one of the, one of the positive keys that people could use when they're learning to squat and one of the errors that we see is, deviation away from the midfoot I think mm -hmm. you know going back to that picture we showed the bar the bar plumb line is over the midfoot for good reason that's that's mm -hmm. kind of where it should be is the midfoot um, and I think you're going to get optimal force production out of the midfoot um, if you look at like the arch of the foot and the structure that it provides mm -hmm. you know it, it makes sense to use that to your benefit rather than too far back too far medial too far lateral too far forward mm -hmm. there's deviations you can get and, and problems you can have in any of those directions but a neutral approach is probably a good place to start <laughs> yeah so do you want to get into loading or common faults we've touched on some of the common faults which are and again like you said it's a it's a chain of events like uh yeah, if the ankles drop navicular if there's a navicular drop in the ankles where they're everting then it's going to affect at the knees and the hips and then ultimately those three joints are going to affect the spine and so i mean yeah. the ma main common faults for me because there because there is so much variation in this is basically flexion of the spine or overextension for that matter yep. uh, too much flexion extension outside of neutral because i say that but then you watch an olympic lifter and they're clearly overly extended in their position but it's their sport they're training for a specific they're training that for a specific reason and that's to keep the barbell or their spine vertical to keep the weight from falling forward and so on and so on but generally is too much flexion or extension flexion or extension and then a, a, a valgus of the knee or a navicular drop of the ankle. So yeah. those are like the three main kind of things I see. And everything from that, anything outside of that manifests from that. Meaning if the weight, if the barbell goes outside of my kind of line of action, it's probably due to uh, flexion of the spine, for example. Um, yeah. It's not necessarily the knee or the ankle or the hip position uh, because if we, just limited the range of motion, but kept our, and, the, and also kept our spine neutral, then we would have been able to maintain that. Yeah, I, I don't have any disagreement there as far as major errors. Um, do you, would you say, would you rather have someone err on the side of too much spinal extension rather than flexion? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, one thing though, that when we talk about the spine, we're typically like looking at the thoracic and lumbar region, but it's important to also note the cervical region too. And like people either looking down or looking up, like they might have a neutral spine, but they're doing one of these. And it's like, man, yeah. you're under load and you're straining your neck. Like, just keep that in mind that you got three, 400 pounds on your, on your back and you're curling your head around that, like yeah, in an effort to keep your chest up. Like those cues are, I get those cues, but they're just, I think it can really tell the, not awareness or maturity, but like the time spent around a movement or around a weight room to simply just be, hey, chest up or straighten your spine or like those things are, or, or like look, up. I remember vividly in high school, every football coach look to the ceiling when you squat and it's like, so then I'm going through life like this, <laughs> like looking for the answer or something. And it's not, that's, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's another another one to be asking why. Um, mm -hmm. I, I saw actually as I was looking for some good videos here for this discussion, there was a an interesting video I was watching. Um, it's it's very uh, Mark Ripito influenced. It wasn't mm -hmm. Mark, but um, basically, so one of the things Mark does when he teaches the squat that I I think is helpful is he'll have somebody just body weight squat, get down at the, the you know the hole in the bottom position of the squat, and then he'll push on the basically the lumbar spine or the sacrum 
kind of push down and provide some external resistance and say, okay, push here, push up right here. Um, so you're kind of driving the hips upwards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good, it's a good tactile cue to get people realizing, Oh, push, push the hips up. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this coach was having the, the client, this was like a first time squatter. He was like, okay, I want you to look at a spot like six feet in front of you mm -hmm. and, and do this. And he provided external pressure uh, or manual resistance. And now I said, okay, and then do it again. And now this time look straight up, which one feels more like you're, you know, getting more hip drive and the client preferred the one looking, you know, at a spot on the floor. Mm -hmm. I think it makes more sense from a, if you look kind of head to toe from a kinesthetic chain type of perspective, this is clearly a, a kink in the chain. Like that doesn't make any sense from a, mm -hmm. you know, a strength perspective to have this the neck up here. Like you're automatically like just, you've just taken the neck and the upper back to a degree out of, out of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas if you have it in a neutral position, we're not saying, obviously there's a danger of looking down and, and shifting forward or falling forward. Um, but you can, you can, you can look kind of neutrally ahead without falling forward. So mm -hmm. I, I, I tend to favor that, that type of a, a neutral C spine where you're kind of gazing downwards, not straight down, but um, rather than this. <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing that you brought up, uh, or kind of alluded to that I see as a common fault is timing as well. Either someone's pushing the hips back way too much before they start bending at the knees or bending at the knees before they start pushing back at the hips. And conversely on the way up too, pushing the shins back. And then that's like now pitching the person forward. So joint timing. And I mean, I think that's also maybe where a goblet squat is helpful is it kind of corrects that. And another variation actually of a goblet squat is uh, holding it here, a plate or a, uh, a light kettlebell or a light plate. As you go to squat down, press the weight out in front of you. And man, I found that to be like a great, um, that helps me with my range of motion and my posture. And it's very tactile. Like if, as I start to press out, I really have to stay kind of a little bit more erect, certainly neutral in order to kind of safely move through the squat. So that's another variation as far as like a a teaching a teaching variation i yeah. want to overload that so what are your so i've got two things as far as errors that i want to get your thoughts on and they kind of work together so depth and butt wink so i i wanted to see first let's talk about butt wink just what what do you when i say that what do you think of yeah it's just it's uh the version i heard of is a pooping dog where it, you know <laughs> you kind of like tuck your hips underneath your spine like you almost fold your butt or your backside or your butt underneath your, your, uh, your spine somehow. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's kind of like a loss of rigidity in the spine or the lower regions of the spine at the bottom of a squat or not even the bottom on the way down perhaps. Yeah. But are you asking about its dangers or how often? Well, I, mean, I, I just asked what it was. I think that's a, a good description. It's like, you, you can kind of see kind of a little posterior pelvic tilt underneath. Like it tends to be at the bottom of a squat it's a pretty common issue you'll see it sometimes in in elite level lifters too like it's not something that's just a beginner mistake and i think i have tried i've read quite a bit about it just because i've been like where what is that where's it coming from is it something we need to fix uh, and so that's kind of i guess where i'm headed is um and maybe i'll just give my my insight here first for thoughts here and you can feel free to correct me if you think differently or or whatever but i i've seen I've seen some people say they think it's a hamstring tightness. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, the other thing, the thing that makes more sense to me is um, looking at the actual acetabulum of the femur inside the, the pelvis um, and basically running out of bony anatomy room for more hip flexion. Mm -hmm. uh, I see this like if you were to, for example, do a front squat versus a low bar back squat, it's more likely that you're going to see butt wink with the low bar back squat because there's actually, there's more hip flexion taking place. Your spine is more horizontal. So there's, it, it may feel like you're just bending at the Holding, yeah, yeah. the upper half, but it's hip flexion still. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in many cases, people are kind of running out of that room and there's no more room for the femur to continue doing this, this. So the pelvis kind of ends up mm -hmm. folding underneath. Um, and I think, I think that makes more sense anatomically than tight hamstrings in most cases. Certainly that can be an issue. Um, but um, anyway, all I have to say, it kind of goes back to the idea of depth is, do you think it's, um, you kind of asked me this, I guess, but 
it, would you rather someone squat a little bit higher and avoid a butt wink or you know is it something we don't really need to worry about and, and squat as deep as you want or, or how would you approach that yeah i think i would be more focused on achieving full ranges of motion in more of a warm-up or a cool down type setting whereas in the actual loading i would be looking for as structurally sound as possible movement and so i don't mind a butt wink when there's a 20 pound kettlebell in your hands and you're doing a goblet squat and you're just kind of dropping down to the bottom and then but then play with it kind of like try to extend in the lower region of the spine or try to keep it neutral um, or allow it to flex when there's light weight around i'm more open to like creativity in your movement um, like i don't think you have to always maintain a neutral spine when you're exploring your body and you're exploring movement but when you load it up it's gonna be safer to have a neutral spine in general. So yeah. as far as like a range of motion thing, when it's loaded, I want as structurally sound movement as possible. When it's unloaded, do crazy stuff. Like I remember being at an NSCA uh, and also uh, another symposium with a, a PT there, and they were like, get into bad positions. Like we want you to move through those because when you play a sport, man, when you cut or someone jukes you, you're not always like, here in anatomical position. So because of that, you need to be able to explore some of these uncomfortable or non-traditional areas or spaces or positions, I think in an effort to kind of prepare you for when they happen. Like if you jump down on something, yeah, I generally, like if we're doing a depth, depth jumps, um, I generally want you to land in a safe position that you're ready to then explode out of. But when you come down in basketball, you're not guaranteed this like, non-contact where's my space type of situation so i think there should be some variation in that and i don't know if that specifically answers the question but as far as range of motion again with load i want it to be like i'd i'd rather you squat eight inches down rather than go past parallel under load but when in our warm-up i don't want you to be limited by your range of motion i want you to go beyond a yeah. safe positional range of motion because it's unloaded and it's more safe we have some opportunity to 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 wiggle around there yeah it's always been an interesting kind of an oddity to me it's like no one really knows much about it we don't know if long term it's good or bad like there's just mm -hmm. not a whole lot out there but it doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be a, a, a really significant issue other than just kind of aesthetically it's like yeah that's weird <laughs> the butt wink yeah yeah, and yeah. I think even I'll, I'll, oftentimes with more advanced lifters, I'd be curious of your thoughts. As I think about that, I, I do see it in them as well, but do you think it's almost that posterior pelvic tilt that gets them back into a neutral position because they start so extended that they're yeah, actually think, finding a neutral spine? Yeah, set up place. place. Yeah, if you start hyperextended, you have yeah. to have some flexion to get to neutral. Yeah. Because the more anterior tilt you have the less now flexion or the more impingement you'll have at right. the hip like you were talking about so you know them posteriorly tilting just gets them to neutral but right. they almost need that ex the anterior tilt to set their spine for whatever you know yeah you, i mean that's you, you talk about like instagram model pose of like chest up butt out like that's you know anterior tilted pelvis like yeah. try and squat like that you're not going to be able to reach depth without having some posterior tilt so unless you're an olympic lifter and those guys can keep that but i think it self-selects when you see the high level olympic lifters it self-selects for people that can get into those positions sure and yeah so so olympic lifting is yes it's a fiber and like a a strength type like predisposition to ex excel there but you have to have a certain body mechanics to excel at olympic weightlifting there's some variations in people's lifting but in general the heavyweights look pretty close to the lightweights. Like, whereas in other sports where there's a lighter athlete and a heavier athlete, there may be some more variation in what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like in, in, in uh, weightlifting, that is a pretty specific skill. That ability yeah. to move in that manner is pretty specific. Yeah. Well, should we jump into loading, wrap this up? Yeah, yeah, loading, I mean, for me, loading is very simple. In general, when you're starting, just a basic linear progression is is key for me. There's no when you haven't if you haven't been squatting and and in that 
three year to five year range haven't been doing a <clears throat> a linear progression and you're doing <clears throat> small lob and all this other stuff you're going to get stronger and that's fine but i just feel like you're missing out on low-hanging fruit a true yeah. completion of a linear progression and by completion i mean doing several resets you're just there's just no reason like it, the the 10 sets of three at 95 percent like it's just you should be doing that once you really are looking for there's just so much low-hanging fruit with a simple <laughs> approach to to weightlifting yeah. that there's no need for all that nuance until you've actually wrung out the towel right i think yeah that's a great way of saying it yeah there's there's get as much as you can out of the basics and then mm -hmm. and then start getting fancy a little bit right it's and it's fun it's fun that's the that's the temptation right it's like it's fun to try something new and try a new program and you know you're not it's not going to mess you up necessarily but no but do that in your definitely. volume not your strength training if you, yeah. if you want to get stronger linear progression all day every day i don't like i mean freshmen in college i, I don't even those that have been lifting in high school, unless you're at one of these crazy competitive, like weightlifting type high schools. And even then they probably start with a linear progression. They're not leading off with this, yeah. you know, extremely exciting and nuanced program where someone was diabolically sitting in a lab for whatever, trying to create this perfect thing. Um, a linear progression goes a long way. And I think it's, yeah. I think it's uh, grossly underutilized, sadly. What are, uh, what are some of the maybe loading patterns or supplemental movements that you found have benefited your squat the most? Like, are there, are there specific lifts that you found if you strengthen that lift, your squat goes up? I've actually found uh, a, the inverse relationship to that, meaning that when I squatted a certain way, everything else went up. Like there was a period where I was squatting for speed and every time I squatted, I was trying to literally blast off out of the gym, whether it was 95 pounds or at my working weight of 365, I was trying to literally like jump out of the gym. And that probably had the most translation to the rest of my lower body dominant lifts. I wasn't deadlifting at the time. I was deadlifting. I was squatting twice a week at the time, deadlifting once a week. And I hadn't power cleaned for months. And my power clean went from 265 to 300 and I wasn't changing my deadlift much. Like as far as weight, I was yeah. changing the speed of both my squat and my deadlift. And I literally jumped, what's that? 35 pounds in my power clean. And I wasn't even power cleaning. Wow. It just like, all of a sudden, I just, and maybe it was one of those days you feel really good, but 265 was really heavy for me. At the time. Yeah. 35 pounds was not like a, Oh, that's just, He's learning some neuromuscular coordination. That's why he's stronger. Yeah. Like it was legitimate power and strength being developed from speed. So mm -hmm. um, I think I, I forgot the specific question, but speed for me. Oh, other movements. It was the it was the intention in which I was squatting that really was the transfer. Mm -hmm. oh, like because even deadlift, if you're slowly grinding deadlifts, is your squat really going to get heavier? It may. And it probably will, but like to me, speed is the ultimate king of being able to progress a movement or the ability to move weight. For me, in my experience, in my experience. Yeah. I, did you ever mess with uh, like a basically a concentric only or kind of like a rack squat, like a dead stop rack squat? I didn't. I, I've no, I haven't. I because there's so, again squat for me is so miserable, man. Like you've seen my squat. <laughs> It looks like yeah, those are, those are yeah, even worse. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's egregious. Um, yeah, that was that was one for me that was always I always noticed a benefit from doing those. Basically, for to kind of paint the picture would be like, you know, use the use the rack supports from, in a squat rack and mm -hmm. set them at at the height maybe an inch below where the bottom of your squat would be, mm -hmm. and you start you st like you'd have you have to have a bench underneath or some kind of a box underneath. Um, I guess you don't have to, but that's the way I would do it. it would, yeah. would be to start from a box and you're starting from a dead stop. So there's no eccentric loading. There's no stretch short and reflex. You're, you start in the hole and you're just pushing up from there. Mm -hmm. Man, those are, those are brutal, but I, I noticed quite a bit of help from those. I also, another big, another big one for me was always split squats, um, done like a heavy split squat. Mm -hmm. uh, where How's you're it loaded. 
front, Bar back. Barbell. Side. Everything barbell. In the back? Yeah, back, barbell back uh, position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and just hitting those heavy, uh, mm -hmm. like in the five to eight range, maybe of reps. Um, those were always helpful for me. I feel like I feel like I got a lot of glute and hamstring development from those. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about? So here's a here's maybe a a training question: Is when you're evaluating someone's squat and trying to figure out like where are they weak or what do you what do you look for in terms of determining like how am I going to strengthen this person? What do they need to work on? What are some areas that you're looking at? Well, I'm looking at that before they put a barbell on their back. That's the value of a dead bug to me. And that has just been ingrained into my brain from power athlete days of like, that is where you, you should know, you should know your athlete's limitations before they get to any loaded exercise. Or you have the potential to do that. Whether you uncover that or not um, is another thing, or whether you've been trained up enough to kind of see those things and foreshadow the, the potential shortcomings. Um, so my, my, Simple answer would be we should know that before they get a barbell on their back. Um, but are you talking about mobility or strength? Well, what, what was what, uh, was your question regarding strength? Yeah. Meaning, uh, so so go again. Sorry. Basically, like so, if you watch somebody do a, a three rep max, uh -huh. you can typically see like where where their strong points and weak points are. Uh -huh. Essentially, like where where are you breaking down, or where are you going to miss this lift? What do I then need to strengthen to help you? Like, yeah, you again, though, I think I think you could see that in their warm up. Like, I don't need a a heavy three RM to see that. Now, at some point, they need enough weight to truly like. If they look good in their warm up, then we can take them to a boiling point in their training or like with load. But, um, where am I looking? I, I guess for me, like I'm, I'm looking, are, are you missing the lift at the top? Like, are you close to lockout oh. and you can't lock it out? Or are you missing out of the hole? Or, you know, how does that then influence my decision-making to determine, do I need to strengthen your quads? Do I need to strengthen your, your glutes and, and low back, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, I think my cop-out answer would be like, that's such a nuanced question that for a novice lifter, you, th those, those answers are pretty or more clear maybe um but when you're talking about like the elite of the elite you, you kind of go like yeah if you're sticking at the bottom do we start doing some banded work or chain work or whatever to to help encourage some of that getting out of the bottom of the squat but i mean i don't i don't know maybe maybe it's uh, probably easier to do if we have specific examples we're looking at let me ask you this. Have you ever, do you ever use the box squat to teach newbies? No, it's just one more thing to get out and to move. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, as, as far as like attack, you're, you're, you're asking about like, is that, I think it's a great method for, you know, in the, how, how we talked about mechanical, emotional, and tactile cues. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it, it's just one more thing to get out, really. Um, getting someone to sit back I usually, I usually will provide a block at the shin rather than like sit back this way. Um, I kind of give them, I'll put my hand over their midfoot or kind of toe box and I'll say like, as soon as you run into my hand, like you need to be, you should be sitting back here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess I haven't had a whole lot of problems. Like I'm looking at this Chinese lifter Lu Zhao Jun, and he doesn't push his hips back. His the movement starts at his knees. So mm -hmm. is that a sport specific thing that makes it okay, or is it a hey this is how we should actually do it? Um, but are you do you use the box more so for timing or for like a, a an actual position, like getting the hips back to a certain direction back? Or is it the time? Yeah, I, it's, it's more about getting the hips back. I think that's that's one of the very common errors I'll see in general population, deconditioned people who just aren't very active. They mm -hmm. typically are very. So you talk about the knee knee dominant position of like an Olympic lifter, but the hips also will the hips will move back later in that position, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you don't need to start with the hips or start with the knees as long as you're able to kind of balance that out at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the deconditioned athlete or general population, typically it's like the knees are going to go out and then they just keep going. Mm -hmm. 
where the heels come up and you're kind of you're on your toes essentially um, in a and there's there's no there's no hip back at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so using a box I think is very helpful for that type of error where it's like you're not going to fall over backwards. So you can push your hips back as yeah. far as you can, and it gives them just a little bit of a safety net to be like, oh, that's what it should feel like. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find it a really easy way to teach people who are very who are brand new who are deconditioned. Uh, it's an easy way to show them here's what the position should feel like yeah. and you're not going to fall over doing it so yeah I, I like i like using that for for that specific group well and that's where that's where i found doing stuff like goblet squats like it kind of corrects itself it just yeah. has i don't I, I don't know how to explain it it could be the distribution and balance of where the weight is in, in relation to center of gravity but getting someone on a goblet squat or like as they're descending like i said starting to press out man like it kind of forces you to get into some of these positions that we're, that we're talking about here, or at the very least, it makes it more ideal for that particular body type. Like they're exploring yeah. that and learning it themselves. So yeah. I think what I'm, as I'm saying this out loud, the biggest thing is there is not one way to squat. And I know that's not some like <laughs> profound thought, but just young coaches don't get into the idea that there is only one way to move like range of motion, positioning and all that stuff is going to be dependent on the athlete where they're at that day but as a coach you shouldn't expect that they just stay there either like it's okay if their range of motion isn't you know ass to grass and all the way down I understand that but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working towards a healthier range of motion either so it's mm -hmm. kind of like understanding or having that into perspective as well yeah there's I mean there's a lot of individuality with with the squat, I mean, just because it is a, it's a complex movement and everybody's got different anatomy and, mm -hmm. you know, their structure is going to, structure dictates a lot of squat, I think. Yeah, for sure. More so than most lifts, I would say. Yeah. So be open to working with the structure that's in front of you. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Do you have yeah. anything else you want to hit on? Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a critical exercise. This is a very foundational exercise and I think it's, it's one that you can get caught in the weeds with, but if I were to give kind of like a zoomed out view and approach to a squat is maintain a neutral spine, go to as low of a depth that you can while maintaining this healthy position. And then in terms of overloading it, like a little bit, a linear progression as, and, and ring that thing out. And maybe we'll get into one of these instead of a movement. One of these days we'll talk programming or, some programming methodology or something like that into a safe way to overload. But for me, a linear progression is, is ideal. I think that's a great summary right there. I, I think that's, that's a good simple way to, of kind of explaining a, a, a fundamental approach to the squat. So mm -hmm. I, I don't feel I need to add anything to that. <laughs> and get creative with it too. Uh, unloaded, be creative, get to the bottom of your squat and rotate, look up, like, push your knees forward, push your knees back, let one of them internally rotate while the other externally rotates. Like be creative here too and have some fun with it. So um, I, I would also add that to it. All right. Well, thanks everybody for anything else before we wrap that or? I just want to keep talking. Quit your yapping, I said, uh, said so famously here uh, recently. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we took, we took so much time off. So we're like double, doubling down on time for this one. Yeah. So maybe we should just talk. Maybe we should like transition to something really offensive to see if anyone's listening long enough to, to make <laughs> anyway. Well, I appreciate, appreciate you guys listening for those of you who have stuck around this long and hopefully there's been some, uh, some value here, at least just in hearing the two of us discuss and kind of mentally wrestle through some of this. So thanks everybody. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon.